Thank you to our worship team for leading us into God's presence today. Thank you for being here to worship on this wonderful Palm Sunday. I almost feel like saying, you know, like I'm standing in front of a crime scene or something and, you know, there's nothing happening behind me. Don't worry about what's here. Just, just stay focused on the present for a moment. Uh, on Palm Sunday, we're at the, uh, you know, we're just starting Holy Week, and there's a lot coming up. Today, the families in our Family Promise Ministry are moving into the church. If you have a chance to volunteer this week, it's one of the best opportunities that we have to do face-to-face -face ministry with people in need. So I invite you, as you're leaving the church, there's a table and a display that says um, Family Promise. If there's any openings, go ahead and, and see if you can work it into your schedule to just share some love with the families that we'll be, we'll be offering hospitality to this week. Then as we go through the week, Monday, Thursday, that's the day we have special worship services to remember the Last Supper when Jesus took the, the ancient Passover service and changed it forever. When he took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body, and he took the cup and he said, this cup is the blood of the new covenant which I pour out for your, the forgiveness of sins. And of course, this year it's a, a especially special because it's the end of our Lent series of stinky feet because Jesus also washed his disciples' feet. So we're hoping everybody will come. You'll notice that the, well, if you look behind everything, you can notice that there's no communion on the altar today. It's our tradition at this church that on Palm Sunday, we don't have Holy Communion with the encouragement that people come on Monday, Thursday and celebrate the last, the, uh, the Lord's Supper together then. That day, the service, we have a morning service at 10 o'clock and an evening service at 6.30. Good Friday, we have a 10 a.m. service. And then just to mess with everybody, we have a 7.30 service in the evening. So Monday, Thursday, 6.30, Good Friday, 7.30. That's kind of intentional. The Good Friday service is all about light and darkness. And um, it's a little bit later in the evening so that as you leave that service, you get the effect of, of leaving in total darkness as Jesus has given his life on the cross for us and for our salvation. And then uh, Saturday is the Easter egg hunt. I invite you to come and bring kids and spread the word in your neighborhood and invite kids off the street if you know them. Um, <laughs> If you don't, that would be a bad thing. Uh, so anyway, uh, Sunday morning, Easter Sunday, we have a sunrise service at 7 a.m. Our youth are hosting our annual uh, Easter breakfast starting at 7.30 and serving straight through the morning till 11.30. And then our, our services here in the sanctuary are 8 a.m., 9.30, and 11 a.m. Invite you to come to any of them or all of them. I'll be at all of them, so you guys might as well be at all of them too. Um, and so just a wonderful day celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. I think that covers everything. So today on Palm Sunday, let me give you a couple instructions. Our, our, the one sharing the word of God with us today is, is Pastor Dick Roy. He's going to be bringing God's word to us. We're going to have the reading of our processional gospel as we hear the story of Jesus riding into Jerusalem. And then as we begin with our opening music, we're going to invite you to bring your palm branches forward and go ahead and lay them down. It's actually going to be part of the, the drama presentation that we're going to be having a little bit later in the service. So go ahead and leave your pews and bring your palm branches forward and leave them by the altar up here and then return to your pews as the music music plays and as you join in singing. So I invite you now to please stand as I read for you the gospel. 
from the Gospel of St. Luke, the 19th chapter. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. He went along, the pe along, people spread their cloaks along the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Let us sing and rejoice together. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship today. Yeah. 
Thank you so much for the love that you give us all. And I think it's a special thing that we can all come together openly, praise you, and, and worship you. Um, you just do so many amazing things um, through this church, through each, each person here today, Lord. And we pray that you just continue to guide our thoughts, our actions, our words, and everything. Um, let it just be pleasing and be um, worshipful um, to you, Lord. In your name we pray. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. And when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. The God I serve knows only how to triumph My God will never fail Oh, my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory Jesus, every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giants, cause I know how this story ends. Yes, I know how the story ends. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take with the enemy man for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take with the enemy man for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good i'm gonna see a victory i'm gonna see a victory for the I know how this story ends. Oh, my God will never fail. I invite you to be seated.
It's a momentous day in history, the triumphant entry of Jesus on a divine mission. Let's listen in to two of Jesus' disciples. Andrew, you won't believe it. Jesus told us to fetch a donkey for him. Really, Peter? A donkey? Why on earth does he need a donkey? Well, uh, apparently it's for his grand entrance into Jerusalem. Oh, ah, you mean like a donkey parade? Exactly, but it gets even better. Jesus said, go to the village and you will find a donkey tied there with her colt. Untie them and bring them to me. <laughs> it sounds like a donkey napping to me. Let's go. Cue the sound effect. <laughs> the plot thickens. Andrew and Peter are on a donkey napping caper. Let's follow them to the scene of the intended crime. How are we supposed to find a donkey? As if it will just be standing there waiting for us. Shh! There's the chosen donkey and colt. <laughs> Amazing. I hope they don't have a neighborhood watch around here. <laughs> Quick, let's get them to Jesus. As we leave the scene of the crime, here comes Jesus, the superstar, ready for his grand entrance. <laughs> Jesus, here's the donkey you requested. Andrew and I completed the mission. Behold, your king is here. Come on, donkey. This is your moment in the spotlight. <clears throat> I'll, I'll give him a lift. This better be a one-time thing, buddy. Because the pay for this side gig ain't much. Fear not, noble beast. Today you carry the savior of all. Hey, who are you calling beast? Oh, sorry. Fear not, you beautiful, astounding creature. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's get this over with. The crowd is getting restless. Let's wait to see what happens. The Messiah is here. Donkey wasn't stolen, but borrowed with permission. See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on the donkey. Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest! Hosanna! Hosanna! Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest! Hail to the donkey king! Oh. 
Thank you, astounding creature, for your service. And don't forget to give me a five-star review on the Lyft app. <laughs> Guess what? That's how we became the first donkey nappers in biblical history. <laughs> the neighborhood never knew what hit them. Well, there you have it. The next time you see a donkey in a parade, just remember, it might be on a divine mission, or maybe just posing as a Lyft driver, or maybe it's just astounding. The reading for today comes from Zechariah 9, 9 through 13. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. I will bend Judah as I bend my bow and fill it with Ephraim. I will rouse your sons, Zion, against your sons, Greece, and make you like a warrior's sword. Next reading is from Psalm 118, 19 through 29. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. Your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified 
did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Thus ends the reading. Well, good morning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dick Roy. Um, among those who are pinch hitting um, in the pulpit these days, I am the token Baptist that they've brought on. Um, I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> This morning, we begin our journey together through Holy Week. We do so by taking a look at this crucial moment in the life of Jesus, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It is a very significant event in his life and ministry. There is a sense, as Philip Yancey notes, that everything that happens in the gospel accounts of Jesus' life before Holy Week that is, all his preaching, all his teaching, his conversations with various people, the healings and the miracles, all of that are, in a sense, just an introduction, just a, a prelude, just a, a preparation for the critical events that occur during Holy Week. And of course, it all begins with Palm Sunday. Each of the gospel authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all give an account of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Now, that in and of itself is somewhat significant because there are relatively few events in Jesus' life that are included in all the Gospels. For example, the transfiguration, that moment when He was glorified on the mountaintop, that's not in all the Gospels. Or Jesus' temptation experience in the desert with Satan, that's not in the Gospels, all of them either. And actually, except for the feeding of the 5,000, none of the healings and miracles that Jesus did are included in all of the Gospels. In fact, even Jesus' birth is only mentioned in Matthew and Luke. But here, they write about the triumphal entry, and they do it unanimously. And that's got to say something about its significance in the minds of the Gospel authors. If we had time to read all four accounts this morning, we would see that they're all different. They emphasize different elements. They include certain things. They exclude other things. Uh, for example, just the number of animals involved. Three of the Gospels have just the, the donkey, but the fourth one has a donkey and the colt, and it's the colt that's written on. So there's just these little differences. Details about how those donkeys were procured the, the instructions that Jesus gave to the disciples about that, that is very different, actually, in the Gospels. Um, even what it is that they're waving. Did you know that it's only in the Gospel of John that palm branches are mentioned? The other Gospels don't have anything about that. They all include, however, the donkey. Um, the donkey is one of the central elements here, which makes me wonder why are we calling it Palm Sunday? Wouldn't it be better to call it Donkey Sunday? No, I'm not exactly sure what we would do with donkeys, but the donkey is a much more significant part of the event than palms is, but I'll leave that aside. Some people struggle with these differences in the, in the gospel accounts. They want to pin down which of those accounts is the accurate one, the right one. Are there errors in the others? How can we trust what these gospel writers say if they don't all agree? But for me, those differences have the ring of authenticity about them. Um, they're exactly what you would expect from different witnesses of the same event. There's a, a genuineness, I think, in that. People see things and remember things differently, and the accounts that are given are different. For me, it makes the Bible become even more alive. 
So then, what is the meaning of this event? What was really happening here? And most important, why is it important for us? To answer that, we need to understand one of the sometimes ignored characteristics of Jesus' three years of ministry up to this point. Along with the miracles and conversations and healings and all, all of which are evidence of Christ's unique powers and and other qualities, something else was going on. In his interactions with these people, Jesus was actually and fairly consistently trying to keep his identity a secret of sorts. For example, many of those that Jesus healed were specifically told not to tell people what had happened. One example of this is found in Matthew 8, where Jesus' specific words to the leper that he had just healed were, see that you don't tell anyone. Now, it wasn't always that way. Sometimes Jesus tells the the people that were healed to go and tell what had happened to them. But many times, he told them to keep it private. The demons and unclean spirits that Jesus commanded to come out of people were regularly commanded not to tell people who Jesus was. One time, when the crowds began to gather about him, his disciples wondered why Jesus so often seemed to move in the opposite direction to get away from the crowds. One time in in Mark 7, Jesus journeys to the city of Tyre, where, and these are Mark's exact words, he entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Yet he could not keep his present secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. Jesus goes on to deliver the demon from that little girl, but the point is he couldn't keep his presence a secret. He was trying to, though. He was trying to to, to keep his life and ministry somewhat separate from the crowds that constantly followed him. Or there's this whole parables thing. When his disciples asked him why Jesus used parables instead of speaking more directly, Jesus says that speaking in parables was his way of essentially keeping the crowds from understanding who he was. They were used to enlighten, for sure, but they were also used to conceal. And, of course, there's the well-known passage in Matthew 16 where Jesus asks his disciples, who do the people say that I am? And they give various answers, and then Jesus asks them, who do you say that I am? Peter replies with his famous confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus blesses Peter for that answer and then tells his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. One commentator commentator speaks of this characteristic of Jesus' ministry as his aversion to a claim. He simply wasn't ready to reveal himself completely in a public way. Now, there are reasons why Jesus did this, mostly having to do with keeping a lid on the messianic expectations of the crowds, the misconceptions that people had about the coming Messiah as a great military leader, and other reasons as well. But the important thing is to understand that he knew his time had not yet come. He was keeping things down and settled and somewhat secret from the, from the public that adored him. But when we come to Palm Sunday, the very open public manner of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem marks a dramatic change in Jesus' practice. It occurred, of course, during Passover, and we need to understand that the yearly Passover celebration in Jerusalem was a big deal, a huge event attended by hundreds of thousands of pilgrims from around the Mediterranean world and the the Middle East section around Israel. 
Actually, there are some that estimate the numbers that attended in Jerusalem to be even much more than that. Jesus knew at that time that the time of his suffering and passion on the cross was at hand, and therefore the time for him to reveal himself was at hand as well. The underlying questions that floated on the crowds that were on people's lips was, who is this man? And Jesus was about to reveal the answer. Interestingly, he chose not to do so with words, not with a dramatic proclamation announcing his kingship, but with an open public act demonstrating by his action who he claimed to be. Now, part of the reason why he chose an act rather than an announcement was surely the impossibility of being heard by such a large number of people. But it also followed a pattern set by the prophets of the Old Testament, who often used actions, these symbolic public demonstrations, rather than to make their point with, point, with words. Think of the prophet Jeremiah who once made a yoke, a heavy yoke, and placed it on his shoulders and walked around the streets of Jerusalem to demonstrate the coming judgment that the Babylonians were about to, to inflict upon Judah. Or the time that he bought a clay jar, a beautiful pot, and, and took it before the elders and priests of Judah and smashed it on the ground in front of them to demonstrate what was about to happen to Judah as well. In the same way, Jesus, in fulfillment of the prophecy in Zechariah that was read for us, chose to ride into Jerusalem in an intentional act of royalty, to receive the adulation of the crowd and to demonstrate to them who he truly was. Now, normally, a king making a public entrance into a city would choose the most magnificent and beautiful horse that was available to demonstrate the king's own beauty and majesty. And it's just what every king or every king wannabe would do. But not Jesus. He chose to ride instead a donkey. A large chunk of the gospel accounts of Palm Sunday has to do with the procurement of that donkey, the careful choosing of a young colt, one who, according to, to Luke and Mark, had never been ridden before. The choice of the donkey colt was important, for if the grand entrance into Jerusalem proclaimed Jesus' majesty, the choice of the donkey communicated his humility and his meekness. There are other examples in the Old Testament of kings riding donkeys. William Barclay, in his comments uh, on them in reference to Jesus' donkey ride, then makes a perceptive point, and he writes these words, quote, the truth is that a king came riding upon a horse when he was intent on war. He came riding upon a donkey when he was coming in peace. This action of Jesus is a sign that he was not the warrior figure that people dreamed of, but the Prince of Peace. No one saw it that way at that time, not even the disciples who should have known so much better. The minds of all were filled with a kind of mass hysteria. Here was the one who was to come, but they looked for the Messiah of their own dreams and their own wishful thinking. They did not look for the Messiah whom God had sent. Jesus drew a dramatic picture of what he claimed to be, but no one understood the claim." Unquote. It was a mixed crowd at the triumphal entry. The Romans were there soldiers and their leaders who governed Judea at that time. You couldn't ignore them. Israel was an occupied country under what was at times a very oppressive government. But at this point, they were still pretty much a non-factor in Jesus' life. It was about to change dramatically as the week unfolded, but before that, the Romans really played no significant role. 
and definitely not in the triumphal entry. The twelve disciples were there. They were an integral part of all the preparations and surely were amazed and thrilled at the reception that Jesus received. But John tells us in his account that the disciples didn't really understand the implications of what was going on, not until later at least. The Pharisees were there, and they did play an important role. Luke tells us that the Pharisees, when they saw the adulation of the crowd, uh, wanted him to rebuke those who were praising Jesus. They were fearful that the crowds were turning away from the Pharisees and the authority that they had been gathering for themselves. But Jesus replied to the Pharisees, and this has always given me goosebumps, even when it was read this morning, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Nothing could stop the praise of Jesus that was being given that day. Certainly not the Pharisees. John records them later saying to each other, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. It wasn't the Romans or the twelve disciples, or the Pharisees that really mattered at the triumphal entry, however. It was all about Jesus and the crowd. That crowd, some of whom had been healed by Jesus, or fed miraculously, or been cleansed of demons. Some, most probably, had been healed, I'm sorry, had just been witnesses of Lazarus' resurrection, which had occurred just a short time before. Some had heard Jesus teach and had been astounded by the authority that he presented in his teaching. But most of that crowd had had no direct contact with Jesus, but they had heard about him over and over again. His reputation had spread throughout the land. It was this mixed crowd who Jesus was seeking to connect with that day, The crowd wanted to crown him king and throw their cloaks before him in allegiance to his kingship, as they had centuries before with the uh, crowning of King Jehu. And Jesus did indeed come to them as king that day, but not the king they expected, not even the king they wanted. As Barclay commented, the king they desired was a warrior king who would conquer his foes and establish an immediate earthly kingdom whose citizens would share a measure of comfort and power. But Jesus' kingdom was and is so much more. When Pontius Pilate asked Jesus if he was the king of the Jews, Jesus said, it is as you say. But later, Jesus told him, my kingdom is not of this world. We can't define the realm of Jesus' kingdom geographically or politically. He reigns in our hearts, in the hearts of all of those who serve him as king. And that reign simply doesn't have political or physical limitations. And it has no time limits. It has no boundaries. It will last forever. But the crowds, of course, could not comprehend those truths yet. They shouted wonderful expressions of praise and adoration that were so appropriate and so true, but they couldn't truly comprehend what they were saying. The words they used were familiar to us, or are familiar to us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Blessed is the king of Israel. All of these are phrases expressing praise and adoration, and most of them are straight from the Old Testament Psalms. And then, of course, there is the word that is most connected to Palm Sunday. Hosanna. Hosanna is a Hebrew word that has been transliterated into our English scriptures 
much like the word hallelujah. And interestingly, hosanna is not so much a word of praise as it is a word of, or a plea for rescue or for help. Pray, save us, would be a, a literal translation, and it is a wonderful expression of our need for God's help. And the Scriptures certainly instruct us to seek God's help and rescue, and so it's a word that should be on our lips all the time. Hosanna, Lord, Hosanna. But in this setting, at the, at the great triumphal entry, I think we hear, or at least I hear, just a little bit of the self-centeredness of the crowd, of the what-can-you-do-for-me mentality. Help me, Lord. Rescue me. Provide for me what I seek. Remember what William Barclay said of the crowd? They looked for the Messiah of their own dreams and their own wishful thinking. They did not look for the Messiah whom God had sent. You know, we can find ourselves in that first Palm Sunday crowd. Like the people in that crowd, we too want to follow Jesus. We want to join in the excitement of being part of a powerful movement of God. We want to lift up our voices in praise to Jesus. We want to join the crowd in shouting Hosanna. But unlike most of the members of that first Palm Sunday crowd, we know who it is that we are following. We know what kind of king has come to save us. The events which ensued as that precious Holy Week unfolded revealed what kind of king we follow. A king who is brave enough to die for his people. A king who is holy enough to become a perfect sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, a king who is powerful enough to defeat not just the puny forces of the Romans that the crowds wanted him to defeat, but all of the evil forces of Satan himself. True followers of Jesus, the king, follow him because they have come to know and trust a personal Messiah who died for us, and rose again for us, who promises his faithful guidance and provision, not just for this life, but for the life to come and our future eternal joy with him. You know, the crowd that day at, at Jesus' triumphal entry was a mixed bag, mixed motives in praising Jesus, some pure, not so pure, some with mixed expectations about what Jesus was about to do or mixed priorities, mixed hopes and dreams. It was a mixed bag. Some in that crowd that had praised Jesus so wonderfully at his triumphal entry quickly turned on him just a few days later and shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Others in that crowd later risked their lives to retrieve Jesus' body from the cross and later to seek to help embalm and take care of his body because their love for him had become so deep and so real and so great. They were disappointed, discouraged, but they stayed true to Jesus even as he died. They had signed on to follow the course through thick and thin and to trust in Jesus, come what may. And three days later, their hope and trust in Jesus was fulfilled beyond their wildest dreams. May our experience of Holy Week reflect that kind of trust, that kind of love, and that kind of joy. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen.
shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. In response to the good news of our Savior's coming that we heard Pastor Roy proclaim to us today, we have three things that we, we get to do together today. We get to proclaim our Christian faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We get to confess our sins together and be reminded of the grace God has for each one of us. And as a family of believers, we get to carry our prayers together to the Lord. Oh, and I guess we get to also sing and, and send ourselves on our way. So would you stand as we respond to the gospel that we've heard? Let's confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. 
Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. Having professed our faith and having our sins forgiven, we have that wonderful invitation of our Lord to know that he hears every prayer and in his love and power, he helps us. So let us pray together. Father in heaven, grant us faith that as we offer today our prayers to you for ourselves and the people we love, from our families and the people of this church and our community and the world around us, that you hear us and that you help us. Lord, we pray that we would have the faith to know that you are work at work in every situation that we bring to you. So we start by naming before you the people of our church who need your healing touch. We pray for Dave Zimmer, for Loli Kutram. We pray for Damian Williams, for Sue Hubbard's father, Bob, for Lauren Studer, for Adam Tang, for Kathy Buchelman for Sarah Matthews, Barb Sandberg, John Delaney, Trevor Jacobson and his wife Laura, for Leslie Hogstrom, Dean Sebastian, for Beth Peak and Jody Garrison, for Diane Van Wingarden's sister Marcia, for Jerry and Pastor Sue's granddaughter Sophie, for Brenda Boyce's brother Stan, for Sue Alderson and Gracelyn Van Cleve, for Marcia Stenslin and Mary Beebe, for Peggy Norris and Kathy Ryan. Father, we also pray for our city and for our leaders, for our neighborhoods, for our schools for those who protect us, for those who serve us, for those who are giving their lives to heal us, for those who teach us and our children. Lord, we're a community where we depend on each other and we depend on so many people to do so many things for us. Lord, teach us to work together. Bind us together in unity. Protect us, Lord, from those who would harm us. And in every way, Lord, provide for the needs of those who are hurting among us, for those who are vulnerable among us, who are those who are in need. Fill our hearts with compassion, with grace. Give us strength and resolve where it is needed. Lord, in your mercy, and Lord Jesus, as we begin this holy week, remind us of our own personal need of you, our Savior. And Lord, as we live in this world, as we open our eyes to the world around us, let us see the need for you in the world. And Lord, we pray that you would also help us hear your call that you send us to be your ambassadors, to proclaim your love and all that you have done for us through your cross and through your resurrection, to proclaim your salvation to the ends of this world. Send us as your people, empower us, Lord, that we may be your witnesses to the ends of the world. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us sing together.
shaken, but we trust forever in His name. In the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Forevermore, you are Just ask you to take a moment to thank Pastor Roy for bringing God's word to us. Thank our worship team and Word Alive. They were, word Alive was a little worried that they'd be excommunicated. So um, <laughs> let's give them a reassurance that they're not. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord make his face shine on you. Almost. <laughs> may the Lord grant you his peace and fill you with his mercy. Now go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks to God. Amen.